Welcome to Columbus Metropolitan Club. My name is Anthony McIntosh. I am president and COO of Uprise. I am also a proud member of the CMC Board of Trustees as well as serve as the chair of CMC's DE&I committee. I am also your appetizer prior to the main course over here. All right? So remember, I'm the small piece. This is the big stuff. <laughs> So we're pleased to have everybody with us today. We also want to thank today's forum sponsors. PNC Bank, you guys, we see you, you're right here. We got PNC Bank here. We have Grange Insurance. All right, hey, if you don't give a shout out to yourself, you're on your own, all right? Uh, we got Columbus Gas. Uh, install business. And install building products. There you go. Uh, the Columbus Foundation. Uh, Kramer and Associates. IFF. I know you got a table over there. Let me hear you. Uh, and the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for hosting us. So let's give all the sponsors a big round of applause, please. All right, we also want to give a big shout out to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream, which is being carried on CMC's social media platform. So, okay, now you can go, woo let's go. <laughs> All right, and, and, and now for the, the meal, right? So, Franklin County nonprofits are being asked to do more with less than ever before especially the health and human services sector. Our health and human services nonprofits are being inundated with demand for their services while serving as a major economic driver for Franklin County, generating an incredible $2 billion impact and employing 18,000 people. I bet you didn't know that, did you? You did? All right, good. <laughs> All right, so today we'll unpack the state of Franklin County nonprofits with a panel of passionate leaders. And let's be real, let's call them not just leaders, but they are heroes in some of the things that they're doing today. So with that being said, I would like to welcome Mary Auk, close enough, <laughs> uh, from today's sponsor, PNC Bank. And Mary, the podium is yours. Thank you, Anthony. You did a great job warming up the crowd for us. So. Uh, it's great to be here and see a sellout crowd. I'll say a quick hello to those watching by live stream. I mentioned to Sophia, I think that's one of the greatest things that came out of the pandemic is the live stream of CMC and the, the ability to rewatch when you miss it, not having to catch it on CCTV or wherever it was before. So on behalf of Grange Insurance, Columbia Gas, Installed Building Products, the Columbus Foundation, Kramer Associates, IFF, and the Central Ohio employees of PNC Bank, we welcome you to today's CMC Forum. Judging by today's audience, it's clear that across our business and community organizations, the desire to serve others is near and dear to our hearts. It's also clear that we're collectively invested in ensuring the long-term vitality of our amazing city. We know that there have been a myriad of challenges for our nonprofit partners over this past year. In fact, according to the latest Giving USA data, total giving last year was $499 billion, which sounds impressive, but that's a 10.5% decline from 2021 when adjusted for inflation. So one of the toughest years for fundraising, and I know many of you know that all too well. <clears throat> As the regional president of PNC Bank, I'm fortunate to lead an organization that recognizes the challenges impacting the communities we serve. It's inspiring to be part of a company that leverages the power of its resources to help all move forward financially. But what does that mean? Well, as a national Main Street bank, it means that all of us at PNC take great pride in being active members of the communities that we serve. One of the greatest resources that allows us to do this is the PNC Foundation. Through the foundation, we actively support nonprofit organiza organizations that enhance education with an emphasis on early childhood education. And we also support the arts as well as economic and community development. These areas define our philanthropic priorities and drive our community involvement. Community involvement is at the center of our heart and in the center of our civic engagement, and it's an extension of our commitment to look out for the best interests of all of our stakeholders. 
With respect to early childhood education, PNC Grow Up Great is our signature program. It's a 500 million multi-year bilingual initiative that began in 2004 to help children prepare from birth to age five for success in school and life. As part of this initiative, PNC Foundation has earmarked funds for grants to nonprofit organizations that work to improve school readiness by providing support in areas such as vocabulary development, social and emotional learning, math, science, and the arts. I am confident in saying that today's panel share our passion, panelists share our passion for working to prepare our future business and civic leaders for success and to strengthen our community in the years and the decades to come. So without further ado, it is my great honor to welcome today's speakers. Mario Basora, CEO of Future Ready Columbus. Michael Corey, Executive Director of the Human Service Chamber of Franklin County. Courtney Filato, Vice President and Program Officer of Global Philanthropy for J.P. Morgan Chase. And Shannon Isom, President and CEO of the Community Shelter Board. And all will be led by our esteemed host, the one and only Dan Sharp, Vice President for Community Research and Grants Management with the Columbus Foundation. You can read more about today's speakers in our forum flyers. Dan, we look forward to today's conversation and thank you again for wearing your PNC colors. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Certainly uh, unintentional wardrobe selection there, but a sincere thank you to your leadership and PNC's leadership in the early childhood education space and for keeping arts alive in our community as well. And a hearty thank you to each of you for joining us in person and on the live stream today. And when I uh, look out at this room, it is a beautiful reflection of the nonprofit sector. We're joined here by passionate board members, uh, skilled volunteers, uh, entry-level team members, finance, fundraising, vendors and consultants, uh, as well as executive uh, leaders. And so uh, thank you for what you do each and every day uh, for our sector. And that sector is often recounted as known as uh, hard work and heart work, and ever more, the work is getting harder and it is requiring more and more heart. And we are here to talk about our good work, we could spend this time back, back patting and self-congratulating, and we will have time for celebration, but we're also going to thread a needle today. We're gonna to thread a needle of real talk about what's happening in the sector. We're going to delve into some of the challenges. We're gonna delve into the underbelly of the nonprofit sector and philanthropy where the barnacles live, and we're going to have a, a, an honest, a, a heartfelt conversation that's going to be data-informed. We're gonna cite recent reports about arts and human services here in Franklin County. We'll also cite the recent report launched last week through the Giving USA and the Giving Institute board members uh, who are here in Central Ohio, um, the benefactor group, Kramer and Associates and Hodge group. Um, because there are many, many, many positives to take note of today and so we're going to use that data and the lived experiences of this fantastic panel to ensure that we have the opportunity to have that dialogue and to share and cross-pollinate those ideas and those experiences. Uh, but nobody bought their ticket today to hear me wane on and on and pontificate, so we're gonna dive right into it uh, with the opportunity to hear from our true stars today, this fantastic esteemed um, panel. So, uh, you know, Mario and Shannon, first question for you. As the newest leaders to Central Ohio, uh, what was your observation through the interview process about our community. And now that your rubber is meeting the road, uh, what have your observations been about reality, about our community and the nonprofit sector? Uh, Shannon, we'll start with you. Ladies first. Let me first um, thank you for the wonderful welcome. I have been in this community for now six months. And oh my goodness, um, I had someone, what you I think said to me, it feels like you've been here forever. No, no. <laughs> I have not. Um, the, the interview process, someone being coming into this community very new, my observations were probably exactly what you would want someone from this community to see and know about you. Uh, felt that you were collectively organized. 
Uh, you showed a collaboration and a partnership and a commitment to the mission that I would tell you was expert and is expert. You show a high level of intellectual acumen about the issues, concretely knowing both quantitatively and qualitatively what's in front of you. Uh, you are well prepared for the challenge, and you know the challenge. You know the iterations of those um, that go into all of the issues and the factors and the zip codes and people that uh, are straining this community. Um, I was hired to figure out the homelessness problem, the housing issue, the shelter processes, the efficacy of that. I will tell you in the interview process, um, based on the diversity of voices, those people that showed up um, was impressive. Um, it was a, um, a level of force, I tell you, that coming from um, Ohio, but also being spread across many boards across this country, I have not seen, and here we are in the Midwest, with this level of excellence that I think that people just don't know, and maybe you don't know because you've sat in it for so long. It was impressive. Okay, now reality? Reality. Um, all of those things are true and. What I find is that we're highly transactional and that we have to do more heart work. Uh, I think that we forget, not many of you here probably, but we don't talk enough about nonprofits ultimately being and sitting in the gap when all the other structures that really center people's value and their dignity and say that these people don't have any nonprofits show up. And nonprofits are the mirror of what other structures think are unvaluable or ugly or too hard to fix. And in that, uh, the reality of it is I would like to make that space a little grittier and not so smooth, not so transactional, and that we have to sit in what we don't know, but more importantly, sit in what we have yet to fix. Um, I think that in a lot of ways that even with this, homelessness, um, feels like something that transactionally has to be done through a shelter system. Oh no, um, homelessness and any levels of human frailty has to be done with where is our reflection of the level of care? And that the nonprofit has to reflect the soul of the community, it has to. And as it stands today, I think we have some big gaps in the system. I think that is a reflection too, and that we can't be fragile in knowing our truth. Um, I'd like to sit in this space and speak the truth to that. Um, I think that many of you have given me the opportunity to do that. There are some spaces that are still um, squirming a bit. Um, and so the reality versus what I've seen is that again, we have all the things, um, but I would like to press into our heart. We're glad that you're here. Mario, observations and reality. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Shannon, for your comments. That was uh, helpful and very enlightening and thoughtful. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I will say that when I was um, interviewing at the time, uh, I come here from uh, by way of Dayton and Southern California before that and Bronx, New York before that. Uh, but I will tell you that um, coming here from Dayton, my impression uh, interviewing and even before the interview process, uh, really positive about this city. I think this is a well known as an up and coming city, growing at rapid rates uh, all, all over the, uh, the comparative to the, the fastest growing regions in the country. Tremendous amount of diversity. Uh, and, not just uh, diversity in the traditional sense, but in many ways, uh, the, the amount of immigrant populations that are continuing to grow and move in this community to strengthen this community are amazing. And so I really enjoyed that experience and I enjoyed it when I interviewed. I will say also that when I interviewed, I interviewed with an amazing board at Future Ready. 
And uh, two of our board members, I think, are well, several of our board members are here tonight, but our board chairs are also here, and I want to kind of recognize them. So, Tanny Crane, can you just wave your hand really quickly in the room there? Okay, and then two. <laughs> and Commissioner Erica Crowley, who is also two, she's also one of our board members and our board co chair as well. But I, I point them out because these two are probably um, two of the greatest champions of early childhood in central Ohio today. And so I think most of you who know and work in early childhood know their work that they do. And so I appreciate everything that they, the work that they do in our space here. But I will say that our entire board has been amazing, um, supportive, and I saw that during the interview process. So that, was, that was an attractive piece to me, really bought into the work. If you ask me now, six months later, uh, how do I feel and, and what are some of the differences? I, I have to say, um, I've been really heartened. Uh, so the heart is kind of a word that we've used, I think three, all three of us have used it tonight, actually, today already. So uh, this, we have a great team at Future Ready, and they're also at the table right there. I won't make you guys stand up and raise your hands out there. Um, they do amazing work and they're passionate about the kids we work with. The heart of the nonprofit sector has probably been the one thing that has really stood out the most to me uh, in the last six months. You all care deeper than anyone I've worked with in my time. I'm, I come from K-12 education world sector and the nonprofit world is amazingly, deeply caring, passionate, heartfelt in their work. Uh, my first week of work, I ran into Ann Bischoff uh, from Star House, and I got a tour of Star House. And if you haven't done it, do it. It was the most, all I gotta say is she's definitely in front of me in line to go into heaven, for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, the work they do there is amazing for kids, and uh, it was just so, uh, I still feel great about that. And then the second thing I'll say is we have great early learning center leaders here. Uh, that don't always, that very rarely would get the opportunity to sit here in this seat. And I want to tell you that the people running our early child care, our child learning centers, early learning centers, and our preschools are amazing people that are, you know, uh, behind the scenes doing hard work, working 70 hours a week, six days a week, all to keep centers running for kids and families that need their help and support. And that has been probably the most uh, uplifting, uh, energy-filling experience for me is meeting those people and connecting with them. And so there's lots of them, and I just want to put their voice out there because they are doing, they're the ones doing the hard work every day uh, to keep this region moving. Thank you, Mario. You, you touched on growth, so let's use growth as a jump-off point for the next question. We cannot ignore the growth of this region, whether we're seeing that in construction projects or reading that in headlines. It's the workforce development, not just in computer chips, but bioengineering, new transportation modes, uh, and the needs that are growing in the organizations uh, that you run and, and serve. So Courtney, you have the, the good fortune with J.P. Morgan Chase to see things from a regional approach. Uh, how does Central Ohio Columbus stand out within that portfolio, and what uh, insight would you share to nonprofit organizations on how to prepare for what that next is, if it's a skilled workforce or uh, the next iteration for our community. So um, thank you so much um, for your questions and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, excited to be here. So how is Ohio, how is Central Ohio different? So in my role, I cover Ohio and Kentucky for J.P. Morgan Chase. And within those two states, I cover four very different markets. Um, the one thing that stands out to me here in Columbus is just our collaborative approach. Um, we are constantly setting tables to try to get the right people in the room to identify and solve problems. Um, that's huge. That's a huge barrier in other markets that I see. Is it perfect, to your point? No. Um, I do believe we still have to set new tables, which we've made some investments to that end, more diverse tables, allowing those with their lived experiences to sit at them as well. However, I think for the most part, we're in a really great spot in that, in that piece. Um, as far as preparing for the growth of the diverse population, how many of you have watched Michael Wilkos's census data presentation? Okay, if your hand's not raised, go Google it. Uh, United Way, Michael Wilkos. It was one of the most informative things, um, presentations that I've seen in a long time, because it will show you the reality of we don't need, and you guys know this, to prepare for diversity. Diversity is here. You know, if you look at the 2020 census data, our fastest growing population were people of color, and the vast majority of those were women of color. 
as we look at those populations and we look at how we're changing as a community, this is an amazing opportunity. But also, you guys know better than I, um, the change is happening, the population is increasing now, so we have to figure out what to do now and then how do we build better systems that aren't always just trying to put a Band-Aid over something? How do we create a better system for the increasingly growing population in the fastest growing city in the Midwest, right? So a couple things that I wanna talk about when it comes to the skilled workforce. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot, um, or two things I'll, I'll bring up. One is we have short-term and long-term solutions. So J.P. Morgan Chase, um, as a funder, our model within the foundation is investing in inclusive uh, ecosystems within community. Those ecosystems really uh, focus on four pillars, jobs and skills, small business expansion, financial health, and housing. Our workforce investments are around this idea of both short-term investments and long-term. The short-term is in, in the world of workforce are things like boot camps, right? We at J.P. Morgan Chase today have unfilled jobs in the tech sector that are actually high quality jobs, have good pathways into our firm, and actually only require a certificate or a credential. That's awesome. How do we get more people prepared and ready now? But then we also know, if we look at the data, that the workforce of the future, the ones that are in Columbus City Schools right now, Columbus City Schools is one of the largest workforce training providers in this town, right? Let's be clear here. And as we think about having a more diverse workforce in some of these growing areas, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, IT, we also not just need to upskill and reskill the poorer population, but we've got to broaden participation within K-12. We need to expose more students um, of, all, of all backgrounds to technology, and we need to do it young, fifth to seventh grade. So, um, so that's the one thing, right? Thinking about the short-term and long-term workforce solutions that we have as a community. However, I wanna bring up something that I think you alluded to, which is this idea of, but it's no longer, especially as a funder, about just funding workforce. I don't just fund workforce, I fund systems. So we actually have a grant right now with the Community Shelter Board, um, which you've been killing it, by the way. Thank, um, thank you. You're welcome. You're <laughs> um, we have a grant um, that was really looking at if we can um, sustain people's housing, if we can help them with those wraparound social services, how does that increase their persistence to degree at Columbus State? And what is the economic impact of supporting that person through all of these other barriers that would, which come up in life to persist to degree? What is the short-term impact on that individual getting that certificate or credential? And then what's the long-term impact on them and their family by having stabilized some of those outside barriers? Um, you can't talk about workforce now and not talk about childcare. Period, full stop, right? And, you know, I say this as someone who is a single mother, and childcare is a reality, right? It, it, is, it is a huge barrier to upskilling and reskilling. It's a huge barrier to employment, sustainability. Um, and if you don't have a job, you can't buy a house, right? If you don't have a job, you can't talk about financial health and wellness, right? So our job and thinking about the workforce, thinking about how every organization in this room is part of the workforce solution, because you are truly the wraparound that someone might need in order to get involved, persist through a credential, a certificate, a program, and then actually access the other end and have the supports to persist through it. Um, you know, that's where, as I think about two things, right? We're preparing for the growth of the future, which the current data t is telling us is, is here. Um, how do we all make sure that we're not doing these things siloed? We continue to collaborate as a community. Thank you for that. And we'll jump off of the workforce notion and, and Michael, come your way. Um, nationally, the nonprofit sector is the third largest segment of the economy behind retail um, and manufacturing. And the report that we'll hint at and has been alluded to shows the multi-billion dollar impact locally, 11,000 uh, employees uh, here in, in central Ohio. And growth that we're talking about is often seen as a positive connotation. But it also seems through this report that that growth is inciting some tremendous pressures among, amongst our sector. Softball question, I know. So can you dive into some of the findings from said report, please? Thank you, Dan. Um, it's <clears throat> really an honor to, to be on this panel. Uh, I wish I could get attendance like this at our chamber meetings. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm gonna buy myself some time to answer your question while I think about it and, and say a few quick things first. Can we thank all of the public officials that are in the room and have them stand, please? Mm -hmm. Now I know what I can say, not get in trouble, because Commissioner <laughs> Crowley's here. Okay. Yeah, I can talk about the General Assembly. Uh, second, um, I want to say Eid Mubarak to anyone that is celebrating and might be watching from home. Uh, third, I want to thank my incredible team that I think is somewhere way back there. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for all your work. Uh, thank you to all of my bosses that in the room. It really does feel like a chamber meeting, except there are too many people here. Um, and of course, thanks to all the staff that have made this event possible and our hosts at, at Grange. Okay, I'll answer the question now. Um, so first, um, we have a good problem in Columbus with all of the growth and that, that's happening and the development that's happening. Uh, just yesterday, Amazon Web Services announced a $7.8 billion investment in another data facility of some sort. I'm not smart enough to understand it. Um, but to answer your question specifically and to, to segue here, the economic impact of Amazon Web Services on the state of Ohio, since it first came to this state in 2016, is $2 billion. So we, we just are completing a report, thanks to Chase and the Columbus Foundation, about the economic impact of Franklin County human services nonprofits as well as arts nonprofits. And the finding, that Anthony has kindly shared with you already is that human services nonprofits in Franklin County have an annual impact of $2 billion on our economy. And they employ 18,000 plus people. It's enormous. It's an economic driver, but the strains on the sector and the margins that the sector has to operate within are as thin as they've ever been. In a lot of ways, this is the hardest moment of the pandemic, even though the pandemic is over, because of some of these colliding consequences. And I'll, I'll talk through a few of those things now. So in advance of today, I wanted to share some, some data with you like we got to do a year ago. And we asked our members some questions. And there are a few findings that I'll share. You can check out the rest on our website um, uh, later today. We asked our members what they were seeing in terms of need and how it compared to a year ago. 92% of our members are experiencing greater demand today than they were 12 months ago. Part of that's a growth problem. 70% of our members are not able to meet that need today. 63% of our members don't anticipate being able to meet that need in 2024. We asked them about financial challenges. 49% are anticipating a deficit at the end of this calendar or fiscal year. I'm sorry, 41%, 41%, still jarring. That's due to those colliding circumstances that all of us are familiar with, but are uniquely challenging for the nonprofit sector. Inflation, growing demand, growing costs, and concerns about where revenue is gonna come from. And then the last thing I'll share is in the workforce piece, there are 1,075 unfilled positions across just those 100 agencies that responded. That's actually an improvement from a year ago. When we asked this question last June, we had 89 responses and there were about 2,000 openings. So improvement, that's good. Um, but all of that suggests significant challenges for the sector, even amidst this growth and the mighty impact it has economically. I will say too, uh, we love the arts sector their economic impact per the report is over $200 million per year. That's also extraordinary. And they're facing a lot of the same challenges that the human services folks are facing. So this is where we're threading the needle with uh, difficult news that has to fall into real talk. And some of the headlines that are associated as a reference with Giving USA that was released last week, the Chronicle of Philanthropy headline was, fundraising in 2022 was among the worst ever. It went on to, to talk about uh, the most alarming is that the giving by individuals who typically provide the bulk of donations fell by 13.4% at 
and made up, for, uh, made up 64 percent of all gifts, and that's less than 70 percent of all giving, and that's one of the very few times that that has been the actual occurrence. And so how does that translate, uh, how are you seeing that translate to either, M Michael, your member organizations or an organization like Future Ready from a contributions, revenues, and fundraising perspective? Mario, we'll start with you, Mario. Um, so I think uh, for us, about 98% of our funding for Future Ready comes from public and private foundation grants. And so uh, majority of that, of our dollars come from, uh, actually public dollars from uh, Franklin County Board of Commissioners as well as the City of Columbus. And we have several foundations that are more private foundations that support us as well. We are gonna be expanding, I think, um, our fundraising certainly to individual donors as we go forward. But at this point, about 98% of it is through the foundation work. Uh, but I don't want to miss this opportunity to talk about the impact of funding in the space we work in, early childhood uh, in general. Right now, 50% uh, of the children in this county don't have any access to early care at all uh, until age five. So there's no early childhood learning centers that they're part of, there's no uh, preschools that they're part of until they enter kindergarten. And so you have kids who come into kindergarten with holding a book backwards. Uh, not knowing how to sit in a seat, not knowing how to do some of the basic things that children need to have to be able to be successful. And you, and you may not know, but the recent release of the KRA data shows that, uh, you know, 60% of our kids are not ready for kindergarten. 60%. And that number is even worse when you look at children of color, and I think it's important to point that out, where essentially 72% of the kids, children of color, are not ready for, or African American children are not ready for kindergarten, and 82% of Latino children in this community are not ready for kindergarten. That's 88 in 10 Latino children not ready for kindergarten right now in our county. So in some ways, we're the tale of two cities. We are a city that's growing exponentially in many ways, but there is one sector that's continuing to be left behind, and that's our youngest and most vulnerable children. And I wanna say that because the solution to that that we have in place, which are early learning centers and preschools, are severely underfunded right now and are in crisis right now. Right now, many of our centers, and I know Eric is in the room and, and he'd want me to, I think, uh, uh, say this. In fact, I wrote a note on my hand. <laughs> One in five early child care centers closed during the pandemic and have not reopened. It's right there. <laughs> and I think the second piece I want to share with that that's fascinating is that when you talk to center directors, they have empty classrooms in their centers. And you say, well, Mario, if there's so much demand, why are there empty classrooms in centers? It's because they can't hire staff to fill those positions. Well, Mario, why can't they hire staff to fill those positions? Because they can't pay staff enough to be able to fill those positions. And so you have these centers with long waiting lists of kids that absolutely need to be served who aren't getting served because we don't value, as a society, early education enough to put the necessary funds to support our kids. And yet the data still stands, <laughs> thank you. And the data still stands that 90% of the human brain is, is, is largely developed by the age of five. So if we know that's the case, and we know that's where we can really make an impact on kids, why aren't we relearning our resources right now? Because the house is definitely on fire in zero to five in this community and we have to act quickly. Shannon, can you give insights to the funding structure amongst your shelter partners and the community shelter board? Um, I'll talk very quickly about the, the structure because I think there's a different question that you're asking and I'd like to talk about that. The structure of the community shelter board I think is a really contemporary and progressive structure. It started 35, 36 years ago where it, I call it a three-legged stool. Well, it paired um, both public uh, private as, as, as well as government entities together to build this response to homelessness. Um, I, that, that is the point of philanthropy, right, is to, to, to have these two ends, this, these private uh, dollars from, from businesses and companies as well as our public dollars, our government taxes, our, our tax dollars, and those two ends are supposed to meet, but if they don't, here goes nonprofits. And so um, the community shelter board was shepherded uh, by those that were from the business sector, right? How, what do we do with our profit? How do we give it back to community? 
uh, progressive, current, contemporary, even today. It is exactly what it and how it should function. Um, how it should not function is that somehow then we become a business. Nonprofits, I'm talking to you because I don't want to talk to the, turn around and talk to the choir, and most of you are in the choir, so let me say it differently. I think it is imperative that we call a thing what it is. We cannot commodify housing. We cannot. We will inextricably not be able to solve it. All of us pay into government dollars. They're our dollars, right? And we have servants that go before us to do those and make those decisions. And I am in charge of the philanthropic dollars, a servant, a reflection of community. How do we solve this? Not my dollars, your dollars, our dollars. And if we're losing, there's something wrong, and we're losing. Why? Because housing isn't just housing, and homelessness isn't just homelessness. And for all of you nonprofits, you know that, whether you're talking about education, whether you're talking about domestic violence or rape, whether you're talking about food insecurities, you know you're not talking about that. You're talking about all of it. And it is impossible, then, to ask money for the one thing. Nonprofits are not set up for that. They're set up that the, 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 the profit dollars from the businesses that we support in our community, that the government dollars, the taxes that we pay, meet. And when they don't, we fill in the gap happily. Why are people not giving anymore? Because they're unhappy with the product. And that is what we should be talking about. Community shelter board would be just fine. Why? Because I'm going to make it so. However, and all of you will help me do that. But what we really need to talk about is how we fit into education and other shelters and food insecurities and redlining. And if you don't know that there's food deserts, there's book deserts. Did you know that? There's book deserts. And if you overlay them with the deserts for um, internet service, what would you find? You would find that we do not value a certain population in a certain zip code, and that's what we should be talking about. That, that interconnected nature is absolutely inextricable and something that we absolutely need to continue to focus on. And this is the point in the time in the program that we bring in other audience voices. So if you're in the room and you have a question, please make your way to the back to the microphone. And if you are watching on the live stream today, please use the chat box to insert your questions for this esteemed panel and this fantastic dialogue. Mantra, throwing it to you for our first question, please. Thank you, Dan. All right, I am vetting questions online. So I will start with um, Charletta Tavares. As a former state rep, city council member, and senator supporter of nonprofits, and now CEO of a nonprofit, Primary One Health, why are funders hesitant to support us at a level that supports community needs? Um, great question. Um, so I'm not, so first off, I'm not, I just, to be clear, I'm not familiar with the nonprofit. However, this is what I can tell you. Here in Central Ohio, you tell me actually, how many nonprofits do we have? Well, it depends. Um, Give me a number. The health and Human Services nonprofits is somewhere between 200 and 500. It's hard to pin down. It's hard to pin down. All right, the reality is, um, when, and I get this every day, right? As a funder, it's my job, um, and it's my opportunity and a humbling moment to meet with nonprofit leaders every day to understand a couple things. What's, your pro what's the problem you're trying to solve? What is your proposed solution on how do you solve it? How do you measure success? What does success look like? And how do you fit within the system? When I talk to nonprofits every day, those are kind of like the tiers of conversation that I have. The reality is, guys, as you can imagine, and as you know better than anyone, we all have budgets, right? And so as a funder, it is my job to take the framework for which, framework for which I'm being asked to implement. So JP Morgan, we have our philanthropic strategies that we believe in that are research-based and we lean into, and to figure out how I can take my budget and make the largest impact in community. If I could, I would fund every single person in this room, likely, right? But I can't. 
It is a really tough and humbling spot. I started this job two weeks before shelter in place. I've spent my entire career on the other side of the equation. I was getting grant dollars. I never had this amazing opportunity to figure out where they go. It is a really tough job. It is a tough job because I really have to lean into the research. I have to lean into partnerships. And I have to make some big bets on based on the problem, based on the solutions, based on how we may or may not measure impact, where should we, J.P. Morgan Chase, land our dollars for the biggest community impact? It's, 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 a, it's a great question. I get it every day. Wait, why can't you fund us? We aligned your pillars. I can't, you know, the reality is I just, I can't fund everyone. So for me, what I do here locally is I'm investing a lot more in collaboratives these days. I see a lot of our grantees here who know this well. I really like to invest not in one-off transactional investments in nonprofits, but those nonprofit partners who are, to Shannon's good credit, thinking about the system, how they all fit into it, how they all have a role to play, that's where I'm trying to focus our grant dollars. So um, why we do or don't, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and I would just say, you know, that said, I do believe in the portfolio of work that we as a firm have here locally. It is research-based, it's impact-driven, um, and my hope is that we're really gonna support a lot of the right organizations now and in the future that are really leading a lot of that big work. Michael. Um, first, uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, Charlita is one of our board members and um, one of my uh, role models, so I appreciate her thoughtfulness and advocacy as always. Um, let me try to talk about that from the, the government perspective, which um, obviously is not something that giving USA measures and is a much more sizable percentage of the funding that goes to and through and around um, the, the health and human services and arts sectors as well. Um, we're at a really precarious moment when it comes to that, um, in part because there was this infusion of money between the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan Act, and the supports individuals have now ceased or are being exhausted and the other funds that municipalities and states have will soon expire if they haven't been exhausted. Um, for example, the city of Columbus has about $70 million to get to allocate, the county has about $14 million to get to allocate, and the state has hundreds of millions of dollars, and um, we're not sure what the state um, wants to do with those. In the interim, budgets are being planned for the coming years, and uh, as you all may have seen at the General Assembly, there is a major fight occurring that at the center of it is how money might go to and through the health and human services sector and the people that it serves. The state Senate proposal is so bad that the Ohio House, which is led by the same party, has squashed it and they're in, a, they're in loggerheads right now. And we're grateful to the Ohio House and the governor for, for trying to fight and scrap these elements back in to fund housing and childcare and so many other elements and food access and senior services that, that are uh, in jeopardy there. Um, but on the other side of this, for whatever this is worth, there are tons of infrastructure dollars that are going to start coming in uh, that will be available for nonprofits um, and we're, we're uh, excited about that. We're actually pursuing something to benefit our members in the sector now from the, from the DOE. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the challenges that nonprofits face too in pursuing this. Their, their bandwidth is, is limited. They don't all have a, a full development staff, whether it's a government or a philanthropic grant opportunity. Individual giving is down too for a whole host of reasons as well as giving you say teased out. And um, a lot of the um, elements that uh, Shannon so eloquently discussed that are challenges for individuals are challenges for nonprofit leaders too. They deal with bias as well from funders too. Nobody on this stage, of course, but that is a challenge that's out there as well that, that we see, and a lot of these are challenges that we see across the country, but they're acute here and we can do something about it here. That's the collaborative element that I still believe in that still gives me optimism. My, my staff always jokes with me that I'm, I'm really a lot of fun at parties because I'm just full of negative news. <laughs> we haven't even talked about global warming, but we, got, we can't even be outside today. And people still think global warming is fake. Come on. It has a disproportionate effect on the people are served and our agencies. We have to be working at this as hard as we work to get to the moon. 
um, and we have all these other challenges. Now I'm going to ramble. Okay. I'm going to stop. But well, then thank as you the we question. alternate between online and in-person questions, please, a friendly reminder, be concise with your question and end it with a question mark. <laughs> Shannon, thank you so much for your, your dedication, your commitment, and your passion towards affordable housing and reducing housing insecurity and homelessness in Columbus. My name is Brian Urbanski, and I've been a, my wife and I have been affordable housing providers for 20 years, and uh, last year we uh, established the Aubrey Affordable Housing Foundation. And our mission is to provide affordable housing solutions to vulnerable populations, just like you're talking about, especially uh, individuals returning home after incarceration. And since it was mentioned that charitable contributions are down about 10% year over year, while demand is still up, what, set, what suggestions do you and the rest of the panel have for us in the nonprofit space to be able to increase our chances of securing our funding and resources and what really is a very highly competitive environment today? Okay, everyone's looking at me, so I guess that's my question. Um, you know, I'm going to always, uh, it, it, you'll probably get bored at my answers. My answers will always be that the nonprofit has to do uh, more with organizing around advocacy and pushing for legislation. I think that we have turned in a lot of ways to being housekeepers of, of, the, of the numbers. Um, um, Certainly, uh, I, I bet you 60 to 70 percent of our work is really functioning through being compliant with the many grants and the many requests and the many donations and the many tours that we have to do. Listen, poverty looks the same. Okay. And so I would love for some of that energy to be put into how do we do what our forefathers did and mothers did before us which is organize ourselves to grow and move through grassroots collective voice of things that we just will not tolerate. There's not enough anger here for those that I know who are in the nonprofit advocacy, you know, human being space. I remember when we used to be mad all the time. <laughs> I'd love for that to come back. So I think that we can talk, and I'm open to that, a lot of, about a lot of action items. But listen, a lot of this stuff can be Googled. There's nothing new under the sun. What we have forgotten, though, is our power of voice, not the power to organize papers. I would even say that there are some people in here, as I am, who sees that the cycle of keeping us busy makes us so busy that we don't even know anymore how to disrupt the cycle of keeping us impoverished. That needs to stop. Now, I, you know, I, I would love for Columbus here in this state, um, our capital here, for us to organize, um, maybe the chain human to, can organize us around yeah. advocacy and policy and march up there every time as much as the CMC has committed every week to giving voice that we commit every week, every month to give voice to issues that matter and then change something and get out of this cycle of continuously taking money and responding to these numbers and dictums that do nothing. They change nothing. Last thing. I believe strongly that there are people and temperaments that are built to serve the individual and I give applause to them. But thank God they've changed the trajectory of my life and my family. Those one people that decided to save my mom or my grandmother and changed me ultimately. So that I applaud. But I want there to be more leaders in the room that understand we have to save the ocean. And where are they? Where are we? How are we organized? I think it's important for us to connect and get together and to make sure that we push because keeping us separate keeps us weak, keeps us in a cycle of poverty ourselves. Nonprofits, we're impoverished. We see how much money and yet we're losing. That is poverty. And that, that has to be organized ourselves. No one else is going to do it. We are accountable to do it ourselves. Um, that's one thing. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mantra, Thank you. Mantra, do we have time for one more can online you, question? Can I, can I quickly yes. jump into that? Oh. Hold on. Can I? I mean, yes. I'm hyped up, okay? <laughs> and I know my government affairs guy just rubbed his face because he knows what's about to happen here. Um, 
What I love about the theme that I hear from Shannon today is systems. What I think is really interesting here in Columbus is to your point, like we have a lot of data. We do a lot of problem observation here. It is really hard to drive to action. Our nonprofit partners, as we know, you know, dollars are decreasing, need is increasing. Like we're just trying to keep the wheels on, right, as a, as a community. Um, I started here at JP Morgan Chase um, in March 2nd, 2020, two weeks before shelter in place. Um, what was, if I look back on the last three years, there were systems that were burst wide open. Things that we said never could have happened that did bright light shine on some of the worst parts of our community uh, to offer and ask that we reflect and we really think different. Um, you know, online health care, virtual health could never happen and then it did. We think about some of the child care issues and stay at home, working, all that stuff, right? Never could, but now we tried it and it works. The one thing I think this community is in need of is really this kind of collective dream state vision. So as we build back better, right, from this pandemic, because a lot of shit was broken and we have the opportunity to fix it. And I'm sorry, did you bleep that out? Bleep. I apologize. Bleep. I'm sorry, Sean. And comms and everyone at that table. Um, this is our opportunity to really come together and think about like, so, what does an equitable, thriving Columbus look like, feel like, sound like? What is the data that will tell us that we've gotten there? What are the programs? What are the organizations? Who do we need at this collective table to like really have this conversation? Because you know what, right now, I don't know about you, but it seems like a lot of times we're just in our little hamster ball running around, hairs on fire, just trying to put them out. What are we all working towards and how will we know when we got there? This is why one of the last things is I talk to grant partners about the work, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? How are you going to solve it? Who do you need to solve it with? And oh, by the way, what does success look like? I want qualitative and quantitative data on that. I not only want the numbers because I work for a bank and our bankers like that, but I also want the words, yeah. right? So I think if we think about like next steps and opportunity, as we think about the current state of nonprofits, we have some incredible leaders. We have new leaders. We have established leaders. We have this amazing community that is diversifying by the day, by the moment. You know, we want to be an innovative hub. How awesome is it that we're growing more diverse? And, we, and innovation is in our DNA. Like, we are in an exciting time, but we also have to start to really, I think, to your point, put some stakes in the sand. We gotta be bold, we gotta be brave, we gotta put some stuff out there, and we gotta battle for it. And so I think that's the next opportunity, I think that's the next wave. And the next wave might be a full day summit on this topic because I wish we had yes. more time. Unfortunately, yes. we are done. I'm going to hand uh, the podium back over to Anthony McIntosh for the wrap up. Wow informative, moving, get mad. <laughs> I mean, those are three things that I think I, I took away from it. I mean, I think it is very important uh, across the board just to hear just the perspective that everyone up here provided today. So uh, give a round of applause again for the panel. You know, I think it's, uh, again, I, I very special appreciation to Michael, Mario, Courtney, and Shannon, uh, and Dan. Great job moderating. Want to make sure we give a shout out to those. But also, you know, it's part of my job to also give a shout out to our generous sponsors again. So PNC Bank, Grange Insurance, Columbia Gas, Installed Building Products, the Columbus Foundation, Kramer and Associates, IFF, and the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for hosting. Thank you all. Now, I want to make sure that everyone planned to attend our next forum on July 12th, exploring the promise and peril of artificial intelligence, right here at the Granger Insurance Audubon Center. That's right, for everyone, no forum next week, which is the week of the Forbes, so please plan on joining us on July 12th. Also, please take a moment to answer the short survey that's in your forum flyers. Again, we could not do this without you, so thank you for joining us, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.